Today's episode is a love story between an apsara and a king, Urvashi and Pururavas. It also features magical transformations, celestial theater, and a gem that keeps popping up all the time. Welcome to Stories from India. This is a podcast that will take you on a journey through the rich mythology, folklore and history of the Indian subcontinent. I am Narad Muni, the celestial storyteller and the original Time Lord. With my ability to travel through space and time, I can bring you fascinating stories from the past, the present and the future. From the epic tales of the Mahabharat and Ramayan to the folk tales of the Panchatantra to stories of Akbar Birbal and Tenali Raman, I have a story for every occasion. The purpose of the stories is neither to pass judgment nor to indoctrinate. My goal is only to share these stories with people who may not have heard them before and to make them more entertaining for those who have. First of all, a very happy Diwali to all of you listeners. I hope you have a fun and safe celebration with your loved ones. Let's jump right in. This episode is a love story between a king and an apsara. In case you don't know what an apsara is, I'll give you a quick explanation. Apsaras are celestial dancers. But it's not just dancing. They do sing and act as well, as we shall see in today's story. Usually, apsaras hang around in swarg, which is heaven. And their performances are mainly for Indra, the chief of the devs. He's also the ruler of swarg. Just like modern Bollywood celebrities, Apsaras travel to other places. Sometimes, one of them may perform a dance in the Himalayas to disturb a sage from his meditation. At other times, they may just perform at palaces for some kings and queens who rise into Indra's good books. During all these performances, Apsaras are accompanied by celestial musicians called Gandharvas. Urvashi was one such apsara. Urvashi and a fellow apsara, Chitralekha, were returning after performing at Kuber's palace in the city of Alka. That performance was quickly over. After all, dancers don't stay for too long. They just swing by. Anyway, such performances were a regular affair in Alaka. Kuber had established this new city after being evicted quite unceremoniously from the kingdom of Lanka. It was Ravan, the megavillain of the Ramayan, who did that evicting. But we have covered that story in episode 81 which is linked on the site, sfipodcast.com. Check it out. Anyway, neither Kuber nor his patronage of the arts is relevant to today's story. So let's skip forward straight to the part where Urvashi and Chitralekha were abducted by an Asur. Their flying chariot on their trip home was hijacked. Reach for the sky, pal the Asur said, pointing a spear at the Gandharv who was flying the chariot. The Gandharv said he was already doing exactly that. Couldn't the Asur see he had just taken off and the chariot was gaining altitude? Speaking of flying chariots, why had the Asur docked alongside? Also, could the Asur please point the spear away? He might put out someone's eye with that thing. 
the Gandharv, also said, by the way, his name was Janasabha, but he was Jack to friends. The Asur rolled his eyes at this incredulity. Hi, Jack. I'm Dushtasur, the terrible, he said, before going on to explain that this wasn't a friendly visit. He was here to abduct those two Apsaras in the back of the chariot. At spear point, he forced Urvashi and her companion to move to his own flying chariot. To the Asur's credit, he handed the Gandharv an insurance claim form, a pen, and a refrigerator magnet that said, My passengers were kidnapped by Dushtasur. We are the only sky pirates who do that, Dushtasur said. Keep that in mind when you're giving us a review. With that, the Asur took off. But not too far, because just then, his chariot was attacked by a volley of arrows. They were very carefully aimed arrows, all trying to break down the chariot, but none of them came close to the passenger compartment. It was as if the archer knew that they were innocent Apsaras on board. Under that barrage of arrows, Dushtasur was forced to land. He couldn't control his chariot anymore. And, as Urvashi remarked to Chitralekha, the chance of accidents was very high. Upon landing, Dushtasur didn't wait to meet the archer. He legged it, mumbling something about an appointment that he had just remembered. Urvashi and Chitralekha were a little shaken by the rough landing, but they were fine. Their seat belts definitely helped. The archer reached them and helped them out of the wreck. Urvashi and Chitralekha could immediately see that this archer was incredibly handsome and he had an air of royalty about him. He introduced himself as Pururavas. He was the king of the land that they were standing on. Chitralekha completed the rest of the introductions. And by that, I don't mean that she just introduced herself and Urvashi. She knew who Pururavas was. You're Indra's BFF, she said. You helped him in the last war. Pururava said, indeed, he was. But he didn't believe that he had the pleasure of knowing who they were. Urvashi did not say a word. She was mesmerized. Chitralekha had noticed the expression on her friend's face. Obviously, Urvashi had fallen hopelessly in love with this king. And judging by his expression, he was similarly smitten. The quick-thinking Chitralekha introduced Urvashi as the mega superstar of Swarg. Surely, Pururavas must have seen mentions of Urvashi in the Swarg Gazette. She was a regular on the glamour and fashion pages. And as for Chitralekha herself, never mind about her. She claimed to be just an understudy to Urvashi. Pururavas took them back to the waiting Gandharva's chariot. Janasabha had just filled in the complicated insurance form that Dushtasar had handed him. Seeing the Apsaras returning safe and sound, he sighed and tore it up. The Gandharv took the Apsaras back to Swarg and urged them not to tell everyone about his inability to prevent the abduction. He'd be out of a job, he said. They wouldn't trust him on the next trip. He was scheduled to accompany Urvashi to Kochi 
for the Kuchipudi and to Kathak where she was going to dance the Kathak. Urvashi did not even notice. She was lost in her thoughts. Chitralekha knew that she would have to play matchmaker here. If she waited for either Urvashi or Pururavas to make the first move, she might have to wait for the next pralaya, or apocalypse if you prefer, before they even asked each other for their Instagram handle. From that moment of realization, Chitralekha helped Urvashi by cleverly ensuring that on every tour they went on, they always passed by Pururavas's palace. The Gandharva, flying them, had become used to stopping in Pururavas's garden, knowing that Urvashi and Chitralekha wanted to stretch their legs. Spoiler alert! No one was stretching their legs. In fact, the two Apsaras stood crouching amongst the bushes, observing Pururavas. Major stalker vibes here. Pururavas, for his part, was no better. He could not stop thinking about Urvashi. That might be forgivable if he wasn't already married. To compound the crime, he even addressed his queen incorrectly. Just the other day, when his wife, Aushnari, was talking to him on matters of state policy, he addressed her as Urvashi. The queen's instinct had been to ask if this was a new term of endearment that Pururavas had just made up. But then, she checked herself. She had suddenly made the connection with the famous celebrity from all the glamour and fashion magazines. Not again, she thought to herself. The queen knew better than to confront him right then. Instead, later that day, she ordered her maids to secretly tail the king. The maids had a similar not again reaction. Sadly, this was not the first time Pururavas was being unfaithful to the queen. Pururavas was in the garden pining away for Urvashi. His minister tried to bring up administrative matters. There were important decisions that the king had to make. But Pururavas didn't seem to care. Matters of state can wait, he said. What ails me is a matter of the heart. The minister quietly signalled a waiting attendant to quickly fetch the royal cardiologist. Pururavas was far too immersed in his thoughts to pay more attention. The only thing that seemed to excite him was a leaf falling from above. That might seem strange. It was a garden after all. But there was a particular reason for this. Over the last several days, he had been receiving love letters on leaves. They just dropped from above. They were never signed and despite a complete absence of evidence, Pururavas was utterly convinced that they had to have come from Urvashi. He was not wrong. Out there in the bushes, Urvashi crouched, observing as her latest love letter on a leaf gently floated down from the sky and into the king's lap. Chitralekha was right next to Urvashi. Now, she hastily elbowed her friend and pointed out the big smile on Pururavas's face as he read the latest leaf. Look, he loves you. Go show yourself now, or I'm going to make you. Threatened like that, Urvashi did emerge from the bushes. She made some silly excuse about having lost her leaf diary. And Pururavas 
stammered out a question about whether the leaf he was holding was Urvashi's. She blushed and confirmed that it was. And she said she had written it in a moment of passion about her secret love. Pururavas asked nonchalantly who Urvashi's secret lover was. Was it someone he knew by any chance? Of course, Pururavas knew that Urvashi had been referring to him, but he wanted to hear it from her own lips. Urvashi replied shyly that no one apart from Pururavas knew her secret love more intimately. Just as they were standing there, staring each other in the eyes, there was an ahem <clears throat> sound. Do you need a Vixki Goli for your kitchkitch? The king asked Urvashi. The Apsara said she wasn't the one who had cleared her throat. Aushinari said, I was the one who cleared my throat. I thank you for your concern, Pururavas, but I don't need a cough drop right now. I don't want to tear you away from your very important matters. With that, the queen walked away, but the damage was done. Pururavas was left in an awkward position to explain to Urvashi who Aushinari was. Luckily for him, Urvashi was perfectly cool with it. Hey, this was ancient India. It would have shocked her if Pururavas was not married. But that wasn't the end of the king's troubles. The icy tone in the queen's voice had made it clear that she didn't have quite the same opinion on this topic as Urvashi. Pururavas said that he had to go talk the queen out of doing something rash. And Urvashi said that she had to go act in a play in Swarg. And she was probably late for that. So she'd better go. Though she didn't really want to. Pururavas said he felt the same. But she mustn't keep Indra waiting, must she? And good luck to her with the play. Break a leg, he added. Urvashi was surprised. What do you mean, break a leg? Just an expression, you know, for good luck. Maybe it's not mainstream yet. Urvashi said she hoped it would never become mainstream. Why would you wish another person to injure themselves? Made no sense. Pururavas tried to pacify her. Anyway, if you break a leg, it means you end up in a cast. Get it? A cast, as in the noun, for the group of actors in a film, play, or any other production. Urvashi said, coldly, that she wasn't auditioning. She was already in the cast. So it was meaningless to hope to be put in a cast. With that, she departed. She made it back in time at Swarg. But barely. She made it right before her little platform was lifted onto the stage by the fly system operated by the backstage crew. You might say it was a stage she went through. The assembled audience in Indra's court was a little surprised by her disheveled appearance. She wasn't in costume, and any notions of this being intentional were quickly dispelled. Urvashi missed her cues, not just once or twice, but almost throughout the play. Theatre is obviously not the place where it pays to read between the lines. But Urvashi wasn't even doing that. Her mind was fully on Pururavas. She was dreaming of him and was totally out of sync with everything else. 
When Act 1 concluded, the narrator stepped up to announce Act 2, two years later. One Dev misinterpreted this announcement. Two years is too short of a break to recover from Act 1. They should just consider never finishing this play. It was obvious from the other Dave's expression that he had said the quiet part out loud. The director of this play, Sage Bharat, heard this comment. But he had the miserable duty of continuing because the show must go on. No matter how terrible it was, reacting any other way would create a scene here. Somehow, the audience got through it. There was even a small flutter of excitement. There was a point in Act 2 when one of the actors asked Urvashi's character whom her heart belonged to. The correct answer was Purushottam, which is another name for Vishnu. But Urvashi's response was Pururavas. The next day, Indra summoned Urvashi. As the big boss of Swarg, he had to make some tough decisions here. First, he started by handing her some critical reviews of the play from last night. One critic said, The play was frightful, but admittedly, I saw it at a disadvantage because when I was watching it, the curtains were up. A second one said that Sage Bharat's choice of putting too many people in the role of the clouds in the background was a good idea. With the overcast backdrop, Urvashi's performance was less painful to endure than if she were the only one on stage. Another critic said that it was all just an act. Urvashi's errors were staged. The critic claimed this was just another publicity stunt from the director. Sage Bharat was far too much into drama, the critic alleged. The only props that Urvashi received were those handed to her during the play itself. Naturally, because the backstage crew were just doing their jobs. Indra said that he had a talk with Bharat already. He had sent the sage back to school for a year where he could direct elementary school plays. Hopefully, it would be child's play for him. And now, coming to Urvashi. Like any good manager should, Indra was eager to hear her side of the story. Urvashi confessed to everything. She had been distracted lately and thought nothing other than being with Pururavas. Indra mulled over her answer for a good couple of minutes. Then he reached a decision. Urvashi would be banished to earth. She could go live with Pururavas if she wanted. The Apsara asked what the catch was. Well, if she hadn't, Indra would probably not have put one in. But, prompted by her question, he did insert one condition. The moment Pururavas saw her child, she would be forced to return to Swarg. Urvashi reminded him that she didn't have a child. Indra said yes, he knew that. Well, no sense in her hanging around any longer. The longer she stayed, the more people might be reminded of her disastrous performance. Bharat had already left and it would be a good idea for her to leave as well. Urvashi went straight to Pururavas, of course. By then, Aushinari had come around to accepting the idea that her husband's love 
would have to be shared. The queen wasn't perfectly happy, but she accepted her fate. She even wished the new couple a happy honeymoon when they were departing. And she realized afterwards that she had meant it. Urvashi and Pururavas went to the Gandhamadan Gardens. Things were fine with the new couple. Until one day, Pururavas saw another girl who was also holidaying there. The king seemed totally smitten. This was deeply insulting to the Apsara. In that day and age, Urvashi understood the cultural inappropriateness of monogamy. But this was pushing it too far. While Pururava seemed occupied with thoughts of this new girl, Urvashi wandered off. She walked into a mysterious garden that looked different than anything she had seen before. This was actually Kartikeya's garden. Kartikeya is a son of Shiva, and we have heard his stories before, in earlier episodes. Unknown to Urvashi, there was a curse in this garden. Any woman who tried to enter would be turned into a creeper. That's precisely what happened to Urvashi. When Pururavas realized that Urvashi was missing, that shook him out of his trance. He searched for Urvashi everywhere, for days and weeks, but there was no sign of her anywhere, including in Kartikeya's garden. It might be a stretch to say that Pururavas regretted upsetting her, but he did miss Urvashi and he was desperate to get her back. On one of these searches, the king found a curious-looking red gem. He looked at it, as it shone brilliantly in the sunlight. He decided to wash it and take a better look at it with his tools. But in doing so, as he turned around, the gem accidentally touched the creeper that was Urvashi. Instantly, Urvashi changed back. You see, this was the only cure. That specific gem was the only way to turn Urvashi back. Odd then that it should have been left within inches of where Urvashi transformed into the creeper. But that part is never satisfactorily explained in the story. Oh, my limbs! she exclaimed. I guess being transformed into a creeper stretches you out into a very uncomfortable shape. But Pururavas carried her back and she rested and recovered quickly. Apsara physiology is slightly more advanced than that of ordinary humans. So her healing was also very quick. Pururavas had been careful to bring back the marvellous gem with him. Later, he had the royal jeweller set it in a necklace for Urvashi. Years passed. Aushinari had completely overcome any lingering jealousy that she might have had. They truly lived in harmony. But all good things must come to an end. And so it was that one day, a bird flew into the queen's chamber and carried off the necklace. Pururavas rushed to the scene. He tried to fire arrows at the bird, but his aim wasn't what it used to be. Luckily for the bird. That was just temporary luck though, because Pururavas saw that an arrow did bring down the bird. But it wasn't his own arrow. The king asked a guard to fetch the necklace and the arrow. When it was brought to him, he ignored the necklace and focused entirely on the arrow. The barcode was legible 
and so was the text that was right below it. You might wonder how they fit all of that onto the surface of a very thin and pointy arrow. But hey, Indian weapon making skills were quite advanced. As you've probably realized from hearing other episodes on the show. What puzzled Pururavas now was that the text said that the arrow was registered to Ayush, son of Urvashi and Pururavas. The boy was immediately found and brought before the king. One look at him and Pururavas was convinced. He resembled his father and his mother very much. This was definitely his boy. But where had he come from? And why did the king not even know that he existed? Urvashi arrived as well. She had one look at the situation and realized what was going to happen here. She told her maid to execute Secret Order 66. A special order that she had prepared all her maids with at the very beginning. The moment of her departure was at hand. The maids started bringing in her already packed suitcases as they waited for Urvashi's inevitable summons from Swarg. Meanwhile, Urvashi explained to the king that yes, Ayush was indeed his son. Urvashi had had him on that trip. Remember a few years ago? She had told him that she needed to go on a yoga retreat by herself. Well, secretly, she was giving birth to Ayush. The prince had since been raised at a nearby ashram. It was necessary to keep Ayush's existence a secret because the moment Pururavas saw his son, Urvashi would have to go back to Swarg forever. Let's assume that Pururavas was saddened by this news and he longed for Urvashi to stay. Though knowing his behavior from earlier in the story, it was entirely possible that he had a couple of other queen candidates in mind. That's when I showed up. Yes, me, Narad Muni. Bet you didn't realize that I had a cameo in the story. I am a messenger, so it's perfectly normal for me to be delivering a message from Indra. The message was that Urvashi did not have to return. She could stay back here with Pururavas and Ayush like a normal mother. The only catch was that Pururavas had to be available any time Indra called on him for help in battle. Pururavas said that he was already doing that for Indra. I agreed, but the difference, as I pointed out, was that in the past, he was doing Indra a favor. From now on, it would be an obligation. Although, considering Pururavas' failure to bring down the bird with his bow and arrow, in battle, he was probably not as valuable an asset as he had been in the past. Pururavas said that that agreement was okay with him. But it was hard to read his expression. It wasn't entirely clear if this family was indeed headed for domestic bliss. That's it for this time. A few notes. The version I've covered here is that of the ancient Indian poet Kalidas. Many parts of the story are, shall we say, embellishments. The original story was a lot more concise before Kalidas exercised his poetic license to the fullest. In the original story, Urvashi does not get to stay back in the end. And there's no son involved in Urvashi's conditions to return to Swarg. One of the original conditions was that Pururavas 
needed to look after Urvashi's pet sheep. And perhaps most importantly, I don't appear at all in the original version. Kalidasa's version of me was not easy to digest. Not about my profession. I am a messenger to the devs and I have delivered messages like that in the past. And also not to say that I wouldn't make a great actor in a play. After all, I've been told that my delivery is great. Many of you have been asking to continue the story of the Ramayana. So that's what we'll do in the next episode. We'll pick up the story with the war between the Vanars and the Lankans in full swing. Thank you all for the comments on social media and on Spotify's Q&A. I can't directly reply to the questions there, but I'll address them here on this show. Rez, Prasanna, Darsh, Hiranmayi and Devilskin, thank you so much for your words of encouragement. Vishrut, I appreciate your feedback and I thank you for being a long-time listener. Anivar, if you could clarify your request, I'd love to consider it for a future episode. If you have any other comments or suggestions, or if there are particular stories that you'd like to hear, please do let me know by leaving a comment or a review on the site sfipodcast.com or reply to the questions on Spotify's Q&A. You can also find me on Instagram and Facebook. Be sure to subscribe to the show to get notified automatically of new episodes. A big thank you to each and every one of you for your continued support and your feedback. The music is from purpleplanet.com. That's purple-planet.com. Thank you for listening and I'll see you next time.